of the projects, of course, that you all uh, hopefully approve and oversee. So uh, moving uh, to slide two right now, uh, let you know we uh, continue to have about 100 or so projects that are active uh, in CPRA. Um, about 34 of those are in construction, 53 of those are in engineering and design, nine of those in planning. Of those projects that are in construction, there are uh, 14 of those are hurricane risk reduction projects, 10 of those are marsh creation projects, and then those projects are in engineering and design uh, as we speak, uh, lead the pack for, um, for that category, close to close to 30 projects. So lots of activity continuing to, um, uh, to, to occur, and uh, certainly uh, happy to report that to you. Got some updates on some projects that you've heard about, uh, not in the too distant uh, past, but want to um, uh, give you a, uh, get you up to speed on, on where we are and all of those. So the first one of those is the Simple Point State Park Improvements Project. This is one of the recreation use projects. Again, you're, you're familiar with these. We've talked a lot about them. They're being funded through the Oil Spill Settlement NERDA dollars, uh, but we are uh, completing or beginning to complete phase two of that project. Got a great video for you of the Sycamore uh, Point State Park that you're not able to see right now, but uh, uh, you'll have to take a word for it. It looks fantastic. Uh, phase one of this project was completed last year. We uh, put about 2,000 tons of riprap along uh, the canal uh, there in, um, uh, in the park. It's the Quintana Canal. Uh, to help protect the canal and the marshes adjacent to it. We put about 18,000 cubic yards of sand on the beach there. Um, that sand, uh, incidentally, I mentioned to you before, was dredged from the Chapalaya River. Uh, so we took the problem from the river and, and uh, added it to a solution at Central North Point State Park. Uh, we're done construction on a boardwalk in that area. It's about a quarter of a mile boardwalk. Uh, that's phase two. That is nearly complete. And phase three will begin construction shortly. That will improve the roads, uh, parking areas, and RV spots uh, at the state park there. Uh, obviously, I want to mention our partners. I've moved on to slide five. I don't know if you're keeping up in your, in your packet. Um, certainly, we're working closely with state parks. I'm happy to, to be partnering with them on this project. 48 jobs uh, have been created as a result of this project. There are um, um, five uh, firms that are working uh, on this project. They're all based in Louisiana. Uh, you've got the Southern uh, Constructors out of New Iberia, Sellers and Associates and Thomas C. Associates out of Lafayette, Geoengineers and Foundries and Benjamin Associates uh, out of Abbeville. So glad to have those folks working on this important project for us. Another update on the Terrebonne Basin Barrier Island and Marsh Creation Project. Uh, this is uh, one project, but it's really three project locations, Trinity East, Timbler Island, and West Bell uh, Pass Headland. So Trinity East, I've reported y'all before, was completed last year. Uh, Westwell Pass was just completed last month. Uh, and again, I've had some video to show you of that. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to do that today. Uh, Timbler Island is nearing completion. About 100 acres has been created on the Westwell Pass uh, portion of this project. Um, when Timbler Island is finished, uh, there'll be about close to 300 acres that will be restored there. So all told, about 11 million cubic yards will have been dredged for this project. Uh, about seven miles of shoreline will be constructed and about a thousand acres of beach uh, dune and marsh will be created uh, as part of our first line of defense for against hurricane storm surges along our coast. Again, I want to mention our partners that have been involved in this, uh, uh, not the least of which is the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, which owns a portion of the property here and manages a portion of the property that this project is on. But you can see the, um, um, on slide eight now, you can see the, the folks that have assisted in implementing this project. About 180 jobs or so have been created for folks in Louisiana as a result of the implementation of this project. And then the last project I want to update you on <clears throat> is uh, the Rosehorn uh, Title Protection Project. Uh, phase one of this project is under construction as we speak. This area, of course, was uh, one of the most hard, hardest hit um, as a result of Hurricane Ida. And so I'm certainly happy to report that there is uh, some protection work that is going on in one of the 10 uh, folders or regions uh, in the greater Lafitte area uh, that are so desperately need um, that protection. So, uh, Rosehorn, again, is the second one of these folders that have been complete. Fisher School Basin was the first. We've talked with you about that. And there's a, a wider array of funding that is going into this project, including state surplus funds, capital outlay, the uh, Mesa funds, and funds with uh, partner DOT. So uh, again, the video to show you here, we're driving pile as part of phase one along the Intercoastal Waterway in Bayou Barataria. It's about a two-mile stretch of 
sheet pile that will be driven um, along that stretch. There's another three miles or so of earth and levee that will be completed. Uh, that should be bid out later this year, and uh, construction will begin on that portion of the project again just a little later this year. Um, let's see. In terms of our partners, you can see those listed here. Of course, again, DOT, uh, the Lafitte uh, area, the Independent Levy District is also a partner. A uh, number of uh, about six firms are working on this, about 110 jobs or so in the as a result of the work that's going on here. And, and I would add that this is um, uh, kind of the beginning of this work. Uh, as I mentioned, there are 10 holders that need work in the feed area. Um, we have committed to funding uh, several additional holders uh, already and uh, are looking for ways to try to increase that protection for that region uh, in the near future as well. So I'm on slide 12 for those of you that are looking at the hard copies of, uh, of the presentation. But uh, one of the things that Greg mentioned to you all last, uh, last month in his implementation update, as we talked about the annual plan, uh, was that the Quipper project, or Quipper, would have an upcoming decision at the end of January to make to, to fund some projects. So those decisions have been made. Happy to report almost $100 million worth of new work through the Quipper program was approved uh, with our five federal partners uh, in the state of Louisiana, of course, partnering in those projects as well. Those projects will benefit close to 2,300 acres of our coastal wetlands. Three projects were approved for construction. Uh, the Breton Land Bridge Marsh Creation Project in uh, Flatlands Parish, the No Name Bayou Marsh Creation Project in Cameron Parish, and the Northeast Turtle Bay Marsh Creation Project in Jefferson Parish. There were four projects that were also approved for to move into engineering and design. Um, so again, happy to report uh, those. You can see those listed there. East Coast Marsh Creation, Fort Pouchon Marsh Creation, Northeast Turtle Bay Marsh Creation, uh, and Grand Bayou Ridge and Marsh Restoration Project in Group 2. So I did mention the annual plan, and uh, Greg uh, uh, presented you all with a, a draft version of that, of course, last month. We're in the middle of the public comment period for the annual plan this year. We've uh, conducted public meetings at the end of January. You can see the dates there. There were three in-person meetings across the coast and one virtual meeting held uh, that last week of January. Uh, the public comment period is, is open right now. Uh, and we'll stay through a week from Saturday, uh, February 26th. We'll be back with, uh, in front of you all, of course, presenting the final plan, and we'll take into account those public comments. Uh, there will likely be some adjustments to the final plan um, based on those comments, but we'll be back with you on the 16th to present our final plan, uh, and then ultimately have that submitted to the legislature. Uh, they start, of course, on the 14th of this month. So the public comment period, Mentioned runs through the 26th. Uh, those comments can be submitted through this email address, uh, coastal at la.gov, um, or through regular mail, CPRA uh, 2023 annual plan, 150 Carrots Avenue, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 7082. Uh, you'll note on your slide, as you can see, the uh, Chapel Hill Basin annual plan uh, address there. It's the same address, but just a different uh, addressee. Uh, that plan is uh, is out for public comment right now as well, and you'll we'll hear a little bit more about that from West LeBlanc uh, following the meeting. So I did want to catch you up, um, and, and again, for those of you that are following along here on slide 16, um, the CSAP 2021 Coastal Science Assistantship. So I wanted to catch you up a little bit from what was a, certainly a busy year last year. We did not speak to you about this last year, but this is a, an important thing. Uh, and a good thing, I think, that we do. Um, and so you'll, you see the uh, students that were selected for coastal science assistantships last year. Uh, two from LSU, one from Lung, Lung Con, and one that's doing his work uh, at Tulane. Um, but we have a program, this CSAP program that's in place where we provide stipends to students um, that are essentially researching topics that support the coastal program something that assists in the planning, engineering, design, construction, or monitoring uh, of our coastal projects. Um, we've been really uh, uh, pleased with this, this program. Since 2008, about 74 uh, students have been selected to participate in this program. Nine institutions in the state of Louisiana um, have, uh, have participated in the program as well. They produced about 100 peer-reviewed journal articles on issues related to our coast, uh, research that they conducted related to our coast. And as part of this program, they're required to, uh, uh, to participate in an internship at CPRA. So they provide about 240 hours uh, of labor work for uh, uh, CPRA uh, in the fields that they are, uh, are interested in. So over the course of this program, about 10,000 hours of this student internship work has been conducted at, uh, at CPRA. About 80% of these students go on to take jobs in, uh, in areas of science, technology, engineering, mathematics of the STEM field. 
and three of those have been hired by the CPR. So it's something we're pretty proud of, helps support our overall coastal program and, and, and other um, uh, STEM related uh, um, focus areas uh, within the state. So that was last year. Uh, assistantships to be obviously um, to support graduate students. So there's a, Drs. Wayne, Foster Martinez, uh, Lee Berg, and Kamishwar with Louisiana Tech, UNO, ULL, and LSU uh, respectively. Um, and I'll not read their, uh, their research topics. You can see those in your packets there and I'm folks, I think believe folks can see those online. But for anybody that might be watching us today, any pr prospective graduate students that might be interested in pursuing an assistantship through this program, uh, we'd ask you to get in touch with those institutions, those professors, uh, to follow up with them. Uh, I should have mentioned that this program is administered for us through Louisiana Sea Grant. Uh, some more information can be had uh, about the upcoming awards at uh, lacgrant.org slash research. Time to maybe take some questions and then. Yeah, just pause for one second. Okay. Hey, Inger, see, see if you can just, Justin, if you can help Inger get that, wherever that box is down there, and maybe we can just pop the projector on top of it. This is beyond frustrating, so I've had my microphone done work. Did you have a question, Ms. Cormier? Ms. Cormier? Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm not even sure you can answer this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, for the Coastal Science Assistant ships, um, were, how, was, how was that advertised? And, you know, glaring to me is that my is not in here because we are a university in the coastal you know area of Louisiana. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how those are chosen, how they're advertised, how they're how do y'all go about doing that? Yeah, so they're they're um, so C Grant really administers all of that for us, but obviously we're involved in, in selecting the research topics and so forth. And first let me say um, I do believe that the East has participated in this in the past, and I, and I can check on that. So, so the, the universities that I listed for you there uh, were last year's selections, and then uh, the professors that were selected for this year. So it's not always those particular institutions. As I mentioned, there have been nine global institutions across the state uh, that have been selected. Um, but I, I, I will have to get back with you on those details for how many are advertised. And, and, uh, Yeah, that's, that's something that you all certainly have noticed that I've, I've been trying to report on in the last year or so, um, at least. And, and I think um, we are, I hope I'm not getting too far out uh, over my skis on this, but we, we'd very much like to be able to report um, as, as we present the final annual plan to you all, what kind of an impact the one more career being on the on the coast might have as it relates to jobs. And so we're uh, looking into that right now. I don't know that I'm going to have good numbers for you, but we're going to try very, very hard to be doing that. So, um, Mr. Chairman, if we could see the video. Yeah, why don't you sure. go backwards if you want and just show some of the videos because I think it's some good footage. So, this is the Sycamore Point. 
uh, video that I mentioned. That's the riprap that was placed along the canal, the Squintana Canal. The beach, there's the beach. Uh, it's to the, the right of that previous view. But you can see the nice new beach there. Again, that sediment came from, uh, from the Chapalot River. Uh, this is the boardwalk. that goes out over the marsh about a quarter of a mile, allowing people to really get out into the marsh, being able to sort of view the, view the park, view the marsh itself, um, some of the wildlife there. <laughs> those are those are Joseph's uh, pet otters, <laughs> and there's an aerial view. You can see that Quintana Canal is on the left-hand side. That's uh, Vermilion Bay. The breakwater is out in the bay. The beach is there, of course. So, um, let's see if I can advance to the next one. This is the West Bell Headland. This is looking from east to west. Uh, uh, Bell Pass is behind you essentially from this view. If you were in that, uh, sitting on that drone, it'd be back behind you. The Gulf's on the left. Again, about 100 acres of beach uh, was uh, was uh, built here. The total for the project would be about 1,000 acres. That sand that was dredged from Chip Shoal, which is a, um, a, a relic delta of the Mississippi River. So that's you know, sediment again that's traveled from as far away as perhaps Canada. Uh, ended up in a Sunken Delta and Chip Shoal and has been dredged and now placed back on the coast for restoration purposes. Brennan, is there any participation in working with the sand fencing or vegetation on the heading for that? Yes, yes, that there will be uh, both plant, uh, vegetative plantings and sand fencing uh, included as, as part of this. Chet Chesson is giving you two thumbs up behind you. Thanks, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. This, I, I would note, um, is an area obviously that was this was directly uh, ground zero uh, the bullseye for Hurricane Zeta year before last and then obviously in, in the cross areas of Hurricane Ida last year as well so um, I'm, I'm very proud of what we've been able to accomplish here uh, in light of the fact that it's been a rough two years for this specific location uh, the project team our funders NIP with have really had to do uh, the owner's work to, uh, to make this a success so proud of them for that uh, and we'll advance to the Rose Thorn Project. This is kind of interesting. This is them driving the sheet pile that I mentioned. That's Central Postal in the background. This has been sped up. It's a little bit of a slow process, but you get the idea here. This is uh, about two miles of that sheet pile again will be driven. There'll be about two miles of uh, earthen levee that will complete the ring around that Rose Thorn holder that I mentioned. Bird's eye view of that. This uh, work just been just started. Um, this picture was taken just two days ago now, three days ago, I believe. Um, so you can see they're making nice progress there. <laughs> and I think that's, I think we we'll moved back. Uh, so, all right, there's the students, professors that will be accepting students this year. Anyway, happy to answer any other questions, Mr. Chairman. So, Brent, you, you referenced the, the annual plan, the fact that we've conducted the, the public meetings across uh, the coast. I'm not sure how many public comments we've received thus far, but obviously those comments will be vetted and some will be incorporated into the final version of the plan that will be presented to the board in March. What people don't see as part of the draft plan is the surplus requests right. that we have been developing, discussing with uh, the governor, uh, the division of administration, and we just uh, yesterday began discussions with the legislature on, on our surplus. So can, can you talk a little bit about the surplus? Um, Ms. Gibson is good about <laughs> discussing these, and um, if, you, if you don't have them in front of you, I can I, I don't have it in front of me, so sure, if you want to pass that, that, that would help as a bit of a crib sheet. But yeah, so we have, um, have put together a list. Um, the total, total number is nearly $150 million that so we uh, were asked to, um, um, you know, how we, might, how we might spend those dollars if we, if we had, our, had our, um, the ability to do so. So we've done that. Uh, lots of different projects, lots of good projects across the coast. Uh, including Chapalot Basin Program at uh, funding level that we've not seen uh, in the recent past. A um, couple of million dollars there. 
uh, some work uh, in St. Charles Parish and the uh, Branch Wetlands that have been that's ongoing. We're actually beginning construction on part of that now. There's some funding that we've asked for to help expand that project along the lake. Uh, some more uh, funding for the feet, again, an area extremely hard hit by, um, by Hurricane Ida, uh, and some uh, restoration dollars for the Fouche Parish and the Little Lake area, uh, an area where we all, uh, of course, heard a presentation uh, just a couple months ago from uh, from some folks with USGS indicating that about 100, a little over 100 miles uh, of our coastal marsh have been lost. Most of that loss occurred in this region, uh, and so these dollars will allow us to, um, to react to that and try to restore uh, function uh, of the landscape there. We talked previously about um, uh, some parish matching dollars and doing some things uh, with some dollars we had allocated to that and made a commitment to you all and to the public and to our parish partners that we would seek funding to help um, continue that program. It's been a, a popular program, obviously. It allows uh, some of the parishes to leverage some of their dollars and do some things that are priorities both for us and for the parishes. There's a request in here for about $2 million to uh, to, to do that, um, and, uh, and, and quite a number of other things. I don't know if you want me to go through the full list, I'm, I'm happy to. There's, there's things in there for the Wayne's area on the, the eastern tide. That's right. On the food side, there, there's work on Miners Canal on lifting that, that uh, specific segment of, of the levee. There's the yeah. Lons Pump Station, I believe, that's also in St. Charles. Uh, so just some, some big time investments that could be made with, with, these, with these revenues. And so you will see these folded into the final annual plan. These are not in the draft plan. And so you will ultimately see what our priorities will be in, in the final annual plan. But it's important that we begin discussions with, with the legislature, because this is, they ultimately have final say so on, on if we get the, the full 50 or what the final amount is uh, that will be allocated to CPRA. And so uh, Chairman Zarain will be, will be visiting with you uh, but, uh, Brent, any other questions on surplus or annual plan? I, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'll just add something that we can let mention is um, uh, some funding that we've requested here for uh, shoreline protection in both Cameron and Virginia parishes as well. So, uh, don't want to don't leave that out as far as well, A lot of that is important too, Brent, is because as you're going to hear from Neil McMillan in just a minute on the emergency supplemental and the IIJ, a lot, a lot of these federal uh, appropriations are going to require cost share from us, particularly in Ms. Cormier's area for the 125 million in Southwest Coastal. We're still trying to get our, um, what the guidance is going to be from the Corps on the, the cost share that's going to be required in the Atchafalaya Basin. Uh, but in the event that it does require 35 percent, we've got that in our, in our surplus. Uh, and so if, if the federal government is going to make these investments, we as a state need to be prepared to uh, deliver our cost share on these these uh, appropriations. <coughs> so, any other questions for Brent? Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Mr. Uh, I, I think uh, if you don't mind at this time, could I? I don't see a better place on the agenda, but the uh, body shame structure was fully in position on Sunday. It was uh, submerged onto the sill on Monday. Yesterday, Tuesday, the, uh, the pivot pile was driven, and a little while ago today, this morning, it was uh, pumped out and put on the, the uh, storage piles. So uh, we've made a complete cycle. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate you mentioning that. That's, yes. that's, that's big, big news. You're right. And uh, Thank you. you'll, you'll see some. Uh, hopefully, we'll see some videos and some uh, and an update on that uh, next month. Mr. Hidalgo. Any other questions, comments, or Brent? You done, Brent? Come on. I am not. Um, so we're not going to let Chuck, uh, Chuck off excuse me that easily. Um, uh, certainly appreciate the comments uh, made by uh, 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 uh
All right, so I'm not going to let Chuck off so easily. Um, certainly appreciate the comments made by, by Chairman Plown earlier, but uh, those of you that don't know, Chuck has had a long career uh, in the news business, um, and particularly in broadcasting. Uh, he served as a TV reporter and anchorman uh, Houston, Lafayette, uh, and in Baton Rouge. And so I wanted to go through a few of the looks of, uh, of, of Chuck Perrin. We've got the weatherman look there on the left. I think that's probably an anchorman look on the right through the years. I'm not sure what we call this. Uh, <laughs> the, the pensive stare at the candle look on the right. Um, this is Chuck interviewing Muhammad Ali, and I'll touch a little bit on that here in just a moment. Um, but uh, certainly a an interesting picture there. Uh, some more from his, uh, from his Anchorman days. You see him on the right hand uh, picture there. He's up in the upper left uh, next to Paul Gates, Pat Shingleton, some names that uh, if you're from the Baton Rouge area, you'll, you'll recognize in the news business. There's Chuck uh, on the left reporting for a, um, a TV show that he produced and, and starred in, I guess is the correct word, or was featured in at least uh, for Cox. Uh, for the Cox Communications. This was a, an award-winning show. Uh, in 2002, they won the Best Government Affairs Award uh, nationwide, in fact. Then, of course, let me try to get out of this so we're not all... Uh, there we go. At least that's not blinking. Uh, and then, of course, the Chuck we all know and love uh, today. That was a picture taken just a few moments, moments ago, or a few days ago, as we were talking about this implementation update. So, a few things I, I wanna, want you to know about Chuck. Um, one, he has had this long and storied career. Uh, it's quite quite interesting. Uh, but Chuck is responsible for these presentations that I give to you each uh, each month. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I felt like we've uh, stepped our game up a bit um, in terms of the materials that we're presenting to you. It's a little more interactive, a little more interesting, hopefully. Um, and uh, a lot of that, of course, is due uh, to the efforts uh, of Chuck. So Chuck, personally, I would like to thank you for what you have done to help uh, Help me communicate what CPRA does to the board, to the public, um, and, uh, and to, make, to make me look good in front of this board. So certainly appreciate that. Um, Chuck, uh, as I mentioned, you saw, you saw a picture of Muhammad Ali up there, has, uh, has a, a hell of a lot of interesting stories. And uh, this is a guy that has um, known and interviewed uh, governors uh, from Jimmy Davis, Fox McGiffin, um, Edwin Edwards, Buddy Romer, up through, through present day, uh, all of these guys. Um, he, uh, not just Louisiana governors, he uh, organized and participated in a trip to Thailand with then Governor Buddy Romer, uh, Governor uh, Ray Mavis from Mississippi, and uh, at the time, Governor Bill Clinton, uh, certainly of Arkansas. Um, the, he's a uh, close personal friend of Sugar Ray Leonard. Uh, there's a bit of boxing theme, but uh, that, that, that's a fact. Um, he interviewed George Foreman, interviewed Clint Eastwood, Henry Kissinger. Uh, and I could go on and on, I, I won't. But the point is, if you have an opportunity to have a meal, a cup of coffee, or a beer with Chuck, uh, don't pass up the opportunity. Um, and then last thing I would say is, I, I don't know many people in the coastal program, kind of in this realm, that, that have a unique combination of passion, energy, uh, and sincerity for our coast, and can combine that with the ability to communicate uh, what it is we do, why it's important, um, to, to, to everybody, to us and to all of our stakeholders. And so for that, certainly grateful. As Chairman Pine mentioned, uh, Chuck has been with us basically since the beginning. Uh, he's a big part of what has, uh, CPR has become, has become making CPR what it is today. Uh, and for that, I'm very, very grateful. And uh, Chuck, we wish you the best of luck and uh, just know that uh, you will be missed. So thanks, Chuck, for all you do. And thank you very much. Great update. And let's move on. Members, agenda item number seven the IJA University Supplemental Appropriations follow up from Mr. McMillan. Update since last board meeting that morning, we had an announcement of the $2.6 billion uh, combined with the disaster supplemental and the infrastructure bill to the state. Kind of want to share what we've done to learn more about it, advocate stronger for Louisiana, as well as share some of the uh, materials the uh, administration is pushing out. Um, 
and maybe some analysis on what's remaining from these opportunities um, from the community perspective. So since, since the announcements, we've had uh, some good outreach on the infrastructure bill, as well as the disaster supplemental. I want to highlight uh, two meetings uh, uh, Mr. Klein had when he was up in D.C. One was with OMB, and this is a really important one uh, because we had a lot of objectives to do. First of all, to express gratitude. They take what the Corps provides um, and execute the administration's priorities. So uh, we wanted to express gratitude to them, as well as advertise going forward um, that Louisiana is aligned with this administration's goals on resilience. We have lots of actionable projects that can accomplish that. And as well as that we're sincere about the climate and really emphasize uh, what the governor's been doing with the task force. Um, additionally, we're trying to kind of peel back what their decision making, um, what type of uh, criteria they were uh, applying to what we could accomplish. And as Chairman Klein mentioned, the call share factor, the ability to pay, was um, apparently a role for inclusion in the infrastructure bill. They wanted to be sure that uh, their allocations weren't dropped, and so uh, strong credit to the state for being able to do that. And we have more priorities, more um, coastal projects executed, and we, sh we share that uh, with the, building that relationship. And we hope we can continue to add, um, beyond the staff level up, up to the uh, measure level. We also had a chance to meet with uh, the Senate Appropriations uh, Minority Clerk for the Energy and Water Committee. That's the committee that spends the um, Army Corps uh, funding and Senator Kennedy is a ranking member there, and we wanted to educate his professional staff that have been working at a national level, what we have prioritized in Louisiana, and see how she and uh, the Senator team can help us, uh, particularly as we prepare for future opportunities with the infrastructure bill and standard appropriations. We've also had a virtual meeting with the ASA ACW, uh, Connor of the court, to I guess make sure that we solidify our partnership with him, start cultivating a relationship, and uh, ensure alignment with the core. And we shared, you know, some of the state expectations and um, surprises uh, from the announcement, as well as a uh, tremendous gratitude for him, as well as again sharing the climate, the resilience factors that align with his goals. And uh, we're going to continue to build that relationship. Um, there's a lot of opportunities with him going forward but we're off to a very strong start. And um, on, on some of the more um, execution levels, we have bi-weekly meetings with the governor's infrastructure bill uh, lead to make sure that resilience and cross-cutting, uh, you know, cross-agency projects that CPRA is involved in a lot of unique ones like that, that uh, we're, we're in the conversation. And additionally, we met with interior staff as they're trying to shape this 400 million for ecosystem restoration. We want them to know that it's uh, coastal restoration should be a foundational part of how they look at that. And I think Louisiana can make that case uh, stronger than many states. And we don't want them to, you know, only think Western interior issues. We want them to make sure we're eligible. So um, as you can see, we're doing advocacy at all, all different levels. And again, I just want to show the the analysis we had last uh, board meeting, as well as what what remains, uh, you know, that was hot off the press that morning. What what is uh, still available? And the the spend plan for the supplemental bill um, has a few pots that still have a lot of funding, particularly the FCCE pot of um, flood control and coastal emergencies pot. And there's about 693 94 million left there. Um, for a list of 11 projects, three Louisiana projects are mentioned. And the Corps is going to conduct a project information report to see what needs to be done. Um, and they, after they complete their report, they'll issue their, I guess, work plan subsequently. And um, so while for those projects, it appears they're eligible for more funding down the road, um, like I said, there's 11 projects, a lot of competition, so um, we'll just have to we, I, I wouldn't want to be overconfident or underconfident in uh, its ability to meet the needs. 
The Corps also saved 410 million uh, for O&M to either repair or um, have it ready for future disasters, or if there's unidentified needs uh, that they weren't able to assess by mid-January, they could apply it to there. Um, there is some remaining investigation money, 34 million, so potentially there's some fully funded investigation and capability there. Um, minimal amount left for construction and MRT, MRT is fully allocated. So here's the, the project from the infrastructure bill side of things. And you know what's left for there is um, a lot of construction money. Congress perhaps wanted the core to allocate less initially and let some more congressional priorities develop. But the administration clearly pushed out a lot of funding. They pushed out about $7.3 billion. That said, there's still four points to remain for construction. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, as well as $2 billion for O&M. They'll be divided up evenly over the next two fiscal years. There is some remaining investigation money, but uh, uh, MRNT and the FCCE, they're fully allocated. So it looks like opportunities and those accounts are limited going forward. Um, but as, as we know, the, the course budget is generally in the six and only recently the seven billion dollars a year range, so this is still significant. And next, and you'll have this in your packet, I won't go through every slide in detail, but the administration released a guidebook, um, and it's, it's online, it's at build.gov. And it covers 380 projects that are funded through the infrastructure bill. And there's a searchable Excel, there's a PDF. And I pulled, um, gosh, about 17 uh, coastal related slides and kind of high, bolded, you know, the connection to green infrastructure, coastal, wetland resistance, hazard mitigation. So you can kind of see how there is some level of eligibility for us. And I'll, I'll quickly click through and kind of just share the, the timing and uh, maybe give an observation or two. Um, WIPIA is a credit assistance program for the Corps. Um, this is the first time it's been funded. It's damn safe to focus, but perhaps it's a funding stream we can um, maneuver in future years. We'll see how that goes. Uh, for the FEMA stuff, with the $3.5 billion for FMA, $1 billion for BRIC, $500 million for Storm Act, they will have applications for these hazard mitigations due by the end of the fiscal year, by September 30th, 2022. So we have conceivably that amount of time to get our projects ready and work with your parish um, you know, disaster needs on that. So September 30th is kind of the operative date to keep in mind there. Uh, for NOAA, there's a lot of different programs. Um, so they went through a few of these. Um, they're going to really open up their competition in the second quarter of 2022. And CPRA is actively down selecting projects, discussing what fits in what bucket, and awaiting more guidance. And um, there's more information there, as you can see. For Interior, as we mentioned, we've already been participating on what this $400 million could be uh, come because this is a new program. Interior doesn't have an estimated time for starting this or dispersing the money. They have three to five years to do so. And so we're, we've issued verbal comments and we're considering doing written comments as well to make sure that uh, they hear clearly what we can accomplish. For EPA, um, it's worth reminding there's historic money for their revolving loan funds as well as a lot of specific geographic program funding streams. Their uh, application time is TBD. Um, and for stuff like the Gulf of Mexico program, Lake Pontchartrain program, this is dramatically higher funding levels than uh, they're used to. So I guess we'll see kind of how open their competition will be. And then lastly, the, maybe the most urgent one is this USDA. And, this is something I didn't flag the first time, and I'm remiss I did, but there's $500 million for watershed and flood prevention operations, three hundred for the EWP Emergency Watershed Protection Program. Um, their opening date, these are mature 
USDA programs and opening date is the first quarter, and we anticipate it be in February. So, you know, check in with your uh, USDA ties, see if you have projects to get in line, and um, we don't want to miss this opportunity. These programs have a long backlog, and so it's important to identify and manage your projects so you can take advantage of this. And um, so you can see we have um, six federal agencies that we're you know, identifying opportunities for coastal Louisiana, and um, hopefully we'll have a lot of success. And that, uh, Chairman, I'm open to questions. So thank you. Uh, you just good for a question. We've been struggling at the division, trying to um, get our arms around all of the different pockets of money to this bill. And, you know, we've had several meetings and we're still investigating maybe the best way to explore because the, the idea is we, were, we don't want to leave any money on the table. But one of the things that uh, I was told last week was that large pockets of these programs are really designed for local government. And it's really at the local level that the program was trying to push it out to, not necessarily the state. And then it led to the question of, are the local governments prepared and, and ready and knowledgeable about what to do, how to apply? And, and we have concerns that maybe from the state side, we should try to help at the local. And this is statewide. So this is focused on coastal, but these programs and uh, transportation programs, you know, are a statewide uh, availability. And so, have have you come up with any any other way? I mean, I'd, I'd like to explore this because our goal is to try to make sure we help from the state side wherever we can help uh, to get the local governments uh, whatever the resources to apply, maybe the information. Um, we're not there yet. Got some other meetings in the next couple of weeks to try to iron some of this out. I think we're going to be at that workshop. But um, with one of these taking applications this month, um, I'm concerned that you know we're missing some opportunities. Yeah. You too.
guidance coming out from all of the six federal agencies that you just referenced as a result of this, this all of these allocations from Interior, NOAA, Corps, EPA, USD, and FEMA. Uh, I just think we need to be primed and ready when that, those guidance those guidance packages do come out that we can have similar workshops with local governments that the governor and commissioner are going to be joined at the state level. Is that next week? Already, two weeks. Um, so I agree with you, and I agree with Ms. Cormier that I think some of the, the coastal parishes, not even coastal parishes, but all the parishes, are going to need some sort of assistance in all of the various programs that, are, that they are eligible to apply for, and then what needs to be done uh, to, to hopefully put them in the best position that's um, best position possible. Well, so let me just. Success in terms of addressing some things, we were getting money to some critical projects. But I think it's important within the program if we can find out if there's a way that the state can facilitate to both Lori and, and Laura's comments. Either they're not sophisticated enough or overwhelmed, or there's things that uh, it makes it difficult in a competitive nature is what these things are. Because there are a lot of areas the, across the country that are going to be ready and their need. Today, our mind is just as great. I think ours is great, but that's some of the lies. But that aside, if we're not in there fighting for it, competing it, it's going to go somewhere else. So, whatever from the state level that we can do, the administration or from the legislative process in terms of setting up assistance or programs for local governments, parishes, and the state. And then my question, I guess, and I know you said it to be determined how all of this is going to be administered. And some of the dollars, CARES Act dollars, it was allocated to the state and the state established some programs. It appears, from what I'm hearing, four dollars or others for these agencies, it's going to go to them and then disperse it to whatever applicant or project gets funded. It doesn't appear, it sounds like it's going to bypass the state, so I may say that's a good thing. The reality is I think there should be some, at least, ability for us to provide some assistance and guidance if we can, and not just start with that. As y'all are discussing these things with the feds. So, Mr. Chairman, you're exactly right. The money will run more than likely from our federal partners to the state agencies. The guidance is still being developed. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't think any has ruled out yet. Uh, the matter of fact, I know on the 23rd of this month, we'll meet with EPA and they'll start to roll out some guidance. Uh, the locals will have to, of course, have an application process. That we have to facilitate. One of the things we're struggling with also is, is we have to staff up in some form or fashion because there are lots coming at us through our, our normal protocols, but this money is going to start to pile up and it may not get out as quickly as we need to because we don't have the, the ability to even facilitate it. So guys are still being developed. Locals will, of course, be plugged in, but you're right. There's some, there are apps, there are lots. And we want to make sure that this is something that is transitional and transformative. That it's not a band-aid that for the next 50 years this money is still helping the state of Louisiana. So we're very much in tune um, with, with the funds and we're just trying to make sure we share as much as we can to make sure this pie goes as far as it can to as many people as it can. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, I think 
I would just make one point of clarification on the, the funding opportunities that Chairman Zerang and Secretary Brown are, are referring to, or the additional funding opportunities through these various federal agencies. All of the, the conversations that we've had with Corps of Engineers on what I will call the coastal projects, um, all of that is going to be administered by the Corps. So it's, it's, I don't want anybody here to think that, that those dollars are going to be coming through the CPRA uh, to administer those dollars. And if, if I could, uh, I guess Colonel Murphy is okay with me saying this, but you know, to your point, Ms. Cormier, I believe that a lot of the federal agencies are even overwhelmed for the amount of money that's made. So if you look at the, the, the projects that were received funding either in IIJA or the emergency sub, a lot of those projects are actually being tasked out to other core districts. And I'm talking about core districts in St. Paul, Minnesota, and in Memphis and Vicksburg. So that, that's a whole other layer of complexity for us as a non-federal sponsor on a lot of these. We may be having to have conversations with core officials in St. Paul, Minnesota on Southwest Coastal. So all of, all of this is, is um, to be determined. It's, um, it, it's going it's to take a lot of effort, a lot of manpower, a lot of facilitation, but um, let's just continue, continue these conversations. Because I do think, as Mr. McMillan noted, the governor has packed a, an infrastructure czar in his office that has kind of corralled all of the state agencies on, on priorities. But we, we can't stop there, as, as Chairman Zarang and, and Ms. Pitson said. That, We've got to assist local governments in allowing them to be competitive in this process, too. I do want to put two things on the record. Uh, that the governor has sent one letter to um, Secretary, I'm sorry, to the, actually to the President on Lafitte. It was left out, so the, president, the governor sent a letter to uh, President Biden asking for at least an investigation to be done on Lafitte and looking at what measures we could potentially implement to better protect Lafitte. All indications are that they are going to fund a study uh, similar to what's being done with Grand Isle, $3.8 million. Uh, the governor also sent a letter to Secretary uh, Connor, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, on the Point Celeste pump station in New Orleans events. New Orleans events got $783 million. We don't know exactly what is going to be done. Um, Point Celeste is not part of the authorized project. However, the Corps of Engineers have, has built the Magnolia and the Wilkinson Canal pump stations, which are neither part of uh, the, the overall authorized project. So there's precedence there. I think it makes a lot of sense uh, to go ahead and build Point Celeste. So the governor is on record there. And then there will be another letter that will be sent to OMB uh, on additional funding opportunities for more to the Gulf. So just wanted to make the board aware of the conversations that the governor's had with federal officials. Mr. Weasel? Yeah, uh, great presentation. Yeah, I wanted to add a couple things. Last night, I was looking through the presentation, and it had so much for the IIJA and the initial um, disaster stuff and all stuff, but all the buckets of money behind it. And I'm thinking, I was, I'm committed, I'm going to hire someone to specifically make sure that all of our projects are in, um, in every bucket that they could possibly fit in. And so, we're kind of unique because we've got everything already designed and, and you know, etched out where we can do a good job of portraying what the project is and its benefits and things of that nature. But one of the things that I, I was already thinking we would probably need would be endorsements from the state for the projects that we submit. In other words, this, this project is consistent with the state's master, master plan and master plan. And those type of things, I think, would help us in our application process for those of us that are going to move forward with it. I love the idea of any additional help to the state we can give. But I think, you know, broader, we really all need to swing for this. Every agency out there needs to be swinging for this money, but if it's not, A, somebody else will get it, and B, then we're going to turn back to the state and say, okay, we didn't get it, we need some, but if we didn't try, then where does that leave us? So um, I think we all need to try to be as competitive. Comments. Uh, so, Neil, I'll just ask that you come back every month with, with an update on kind of the most recent intel that we're receiving from the various federal agencies, from our federal partners within the core, <coughs> on timing, guidance, any, any clarification that we can provide um, members of the board. There's various state agencies on here that, to me, uh, are 
could be recipients of these funds, but also representatives of living districts and, and coastal parishes. So let's just let's just do our best to keep the board abreast of what we're doing here. Great, and I just had uh, one or two follow-up comments to which brought up this in about the capacity issue. Um, Congress and the administration recognize that a lot of these parishes, county level folks, have low capacity, so they have. It's really apparent to me in the FEMA dollars and some other ones, they have lots of money dedicated to capacity, but the actual funding pot for the projects is able to be spent down very quickly. So I have a concern, like, oh great, you got a capacity grant, you onboard some people, you make some progress, um, but then the pot you're eligible by the time you're staffed up is dramatically drawn down. And so I think it's really important that. Uh, and I recommend this to the governor's infrastructure czar that we push out stuff to the parishes on deadlines and because um, we wait for specialists to be brought on board, uh, it's going to be a shrinking pot. At the same time, CPRA and the coastal projects in Louisiana actually are very mature and we have a lot of thought out projects. So I think we can actually be confident in a lot of places that the state is a strong, ready, mature applicant compared to some of our peers. So. It goes both ways, and hopefully we can uh, bring the early points. But uh, thanks for letting me have that. And, uh, yeah, happy to I'm to sorry, I forgot that. President McGinnis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This conversation is, is a very good one. I'm glad to see that everyone else is holding well, because I thought I was the only one. And saving our marriage, we have a lot going on. Um, but they're doing exactly that. The, the federal delegation and their staff is pointing us to the agencies at the state and um, we're waiting we have all of our projects um, waiting i had a conversation with mr taylor a little while ago about katrina Rita money <laughs> that we're still trying to spend um and it's good so i know i've talked to you about the water and so representatives rain about all of that so um like you guys said we have to be prepared and we thank um, all of you guys for that discussion i do want to um, ask Ellen to, and we talked a little bit before the meeting today, and I know Representative Zerang is familiar with the Mississippi River Delta Outlet Ecosystem Restoration Plan that was out there years ago. Uh, I believe it was slated at around $3.5 billion for mitigation of the Mississippi and salinity and what it caused and damage to southeast Louisiana. There was a problem when they went to appropriate that money, from what I understand, that the state didn't have a 35% match. Congressman Graves, who was the CPRA director at the time, disagreed with that. I think he wrote it to the word though. And from what I understand, um, here soon um, we will see some language in the word bill clarifying that language for 100% federal funding. And I would just uh, like to see us here at CPRA to track that. Anything that we can do at pace or I'm sure all of Southeast Louisiana, and I'm not sure where else um, some of that, that money goes to. Um, but we just learned about this in Washington, D.C., considering to cast this staff. And it, it, it's a great thing, and it's billions of dollars um, in that area. Which probably can do some of the projects that are already slated by some of the So, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. McCullough. So, then, Mr. McCullough, before we, I don't know if you want to answer the question, but I just I want to clarify the, the comment, Mr. McGinnis, so on that it wasn't that the state didn't have the money. There was significant, significant disagreement. This, act, this issue actually went to court uh, right. about whether or not the Mr. Go restoration was 100% federal or if we were on vote for 35%. In, in my mind, in Congressman Graves' mind, back in even probably um, Chairman Zarang's mind, the language was crystal clear on, on that it was 100% federal. So there is a bill, you are correct, uh, that ultimately will end up in the word of bill. However, there is a piece of legislation known as the SHORE Act, which the governor is going to be going to Delaware next Wednesday to testify in front of the uh, Senate EPW committee. They're doing the field here and there in Senator Harper's uh, home state. And in that legislation, it clarifies that the Mr. Go ecosystem restoration is in fact 100% federal. Uh, so Mr. Go, uh, the lower Mississippi River management study, there's clarifying language that that study is also 100% federal. 
authorizes a bare terror risk reduction system, and then also on congressionally authorized uh, ecosystem restoration projects. It lowers the cost share for the non-federal sponsor from 35% to 20%. So there's a lot of provisions in this bill that are very favorable to the state of Louisiana. And so Mr. McDillon and I met with the governor earlier this week on Monday to brief him on the SHORE Act. He's going to be providing testimony, but we believe that those two bills, that the SHORE Act and the WERDA bill, uh, will ultimately be merged into one uh, piece of federal legislation. So that's it's just a very important, important issue. Several billion dollars of, of ecosystem restoration in and around the District of area. Do you have anything else to add on that? Mr. Chairman, yes, is that retroactive on the cost share? Or the no, no. Um, just yeah, something I'd add on the Mr. Gavin from the word out of seven and just the sections 70, 12 and seventy thirteen, the core did read language as full federal. They just applied that to a very small segment of it and then interpreted it as the rest of it, the, the big restoration side, um, would obviously be standard stuff. So that's that's the foundational disagreement is they uh, checked the box as small as they could and I'll uh, left something hanging in the balance, and uh, we're, we're doing everything we can to remedy that. And uh, you know, maybe we can share a, a short act deeper dive at, at the next hearing. So, sure. I'm interested in accumulating on that too. That we can use as well. That's right. All right, you'll keep signing stuff up in the work. That's that sounds good. Come back for the next one. Sure, act. And he gets up and leaves the table. All right. Good discussion. I appreciate the participation from members. Uh, let's see. We move on to agenda item number eight, the Chapel Basin Annual Plan, and so the ball. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. Uh, I'll be presenting on the draft fiscal year annual plan 2023 for the Chapel Basin. A look at the program highlights. Uh, the program itself um, is focused on science based water management uh, in the basin. Uh, it contains a technical advisory group uh, that assesses the water management benefits of each of the projects proposed and those that we uh, uh, pursue in the program. Uh, we also put on the ground public access projects. Um, everything we do is informed by stakeholder interaction, and this is a smaller part of the larger uh, annual plan uh, for the coastal program. We went out October 11th uh, for new project solicitations uh, that closed on November 15th. Uh, we had two meetings uh, in person, one in Cecilia and one in Platinum, and then we had one virtually uh, due to COVID. Uh, we received multiple project proposals, um, I'd say in the neighborhood of 12 or so proposals uh, that included water quality projects, uh, access projects, flood control and outreach. Um, we also added to um, the list of projects uh, an update to the state's master plan for FY23. So it wasn't something we, we got through solicitations, but we knew it was something that we had to include and uh, projects that we're going to pursue. And then uh, of those 12 proposals that we've got, uh, many of them were uh, repeats and many of them did overlap with what we'd already had on the books for the program. Uh, so we use those to inform uh, the current projects that are on the books. For the annual plan, we had two public hearings, both virtually, uh, January 25th and Monday the 31st. Those uh, presentations can be found at coastal.la.gov slash Chapalaya Basin Program. Uh, we, we do have the uh, videos up. Projects selected for this FY2023 draft plan include uh, three water quality management projects, uh, the Henderson Lake West uh, Water Management and Spool Bank Gapping Project, East Grand Lake Upper Region Project and the Murphy Lake Depth Restoration Project. 
It also includes four access and recreation projects, uh, the Cajun Coast Welcome Center Trail, Boy Scouts of America Swamp Base Boat Launch, Sandy Cove Boat Launch, and a Chapalaya Basin Geo Trail. Uh, and additionally, as I mentioned, we are including the Chapalaya State Master Plan uh, update. A little background on some of the projects that are on the books. Uh, the Henderson Lake Water Management Unit Spoil Bank Gapping Program uh, consists of 25 spoil bank gaps uh, to improve water flow north to south on the western side of the basin. Uh, we have received a 95% design package uh, last December. Uh, we are waiting on the permit and uh, expect to go to, expect the bid package to be submitted in early spring this fiscal year. With a construction date uh, later in the year. Additionally, we have the East Brand Lake Restoration Project. Uh, it includes 12 restorative elements, proposed, again proposing a north to south uh, flow within the basin. Uh, this is undergoing uh, continued design and permitting um, and a robust monitoring current, uh, program that PNC has, uh, has been doing since 2016. Uh, this permit has been resubmitted within the last two days um, after some design changes, and uh, we're working through that process now. As for the access projects, um, we've got the Boy Scouts of America Swamp Base Boat Launch. Uh, we expect a bid advertisement early next month. Uh, the Cajun Trust Welcome Center Trail, um, Sandy Coast Boat Launch. The Chapalaya Basin Geo Trail, which has uh, basically always been on the, on the books within this program, uh, it just requires uh, semi annual maintenance of the geotech or geocache sites. As I mentioned earlier, the Chapalaya Basin Floodway System State Master Plan update. Uh, this was originally developed in 1998 and was intended to have a 15 year lifespan. Uh, that has worn off a while ago, and we are now uh, recognize the need to uh, update that plan. So we're going to have, uh, we're, we're, scoping that, we're scoping that right now, um, figure out what we're, uh, how we're going to tackle this, and there will be plenty of opportunities for public input and uh, to help build the plan. So, as previously mentioned, uh, most of the projects on the books are fully state funded. Uh, I did want to touch on uh, something that Neil brought up in his last presentation, and that's federal funding uh, for the Chapalaya Basin. Uh, it includes supplemental disaster relief bill of $163 million, as well as the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act uh, of about $53 million. That's $77.6 million uh, listed here complete the Chapalaya uh, Basin floodway system. That's the money we think we have the opportunity to do ecological partnerships with um, for the Basin program. So as was discussed, uh, we're not sure of all the ins and outs um, of how we're going to do that, but that is the money that we're, that we're targeting uh, to include in the program. Program next steps. Uh, We'll review the 2023 annual plan comments, continue uh, outreach to stakeholders, uh, further coordinate with the uh, Chapalaya River Basin Restoration and Enhancement Task Force. Um, they did provide recommendations uh, to the task force that we're currently working through and trying to revise, and hopefully we'll have uh, be able to be ready to present at uh, one of the upcoming CPR board members, or uh, board meetings. Uh, we'll continue to coordinate with the board on activities and funding, including that new money that has come down, and we'll work on putting projects on the ground. The annual plan open uh, comment period is until February 26th, same as the Coastal Master Plan. Um, this is a where you can uh, submit comments, uh, either mail or uh, via email. Thank you. U.S. Any questions from the board? <coughs> Ms. Gibson needs some clarification. It, and it kind of goes back to the previous conversation. On your slide, which talks about the federal funding for the Chapman Basin, is that um, money that is the Corps will have or some other federal agency? It doesn't, does it flow through the budget? I guess that's my question. Or is it outside the budget process? 
since the supplemental disaster relief bill, um, we're still trying to figure out that will flow through the feds, obviously. Um, but we're trying. We think we have identified uh, seventy-eight million of that that we might be able to tap into this program. Um, we're not sure if that means that will be local sponsors, uh, cost share, or if we just have to apply for the money. Um, it's our understanding if it's, if it's in the emergency supplemental, it's 100% federal. If it's an IIJA, there is a cost share uh, associated with it. But Wes is correct that the money will flow through the core. Um, so you're not going to see the overall budget allocation in, in the annual plan and the state budget, but you will see our match. Does that answer? Well, that's the exercise we've been we've been going through on, on the annual plan as well, and so there there's there's funding in, in that will be included in the final annual plan that will be specifically earmarked for those matching requirements as well. Uh, having said all of that, Wes, I was I was pleased to hear uh, your comments on the the federal funding opportunity. You know, as, as, as you know, we stood up a, a task force focused on the overall health and sustainability of the Chapla Basin. There's a report that's going to be submitted to the legislature. Uh, it, it really looks at this in the basin as a more uh, holistic approach and not just doing, you know, fishing piers and boat launches and things like that, but getting some, some big time federal offer us authorizations on, on the books and some overall restoration projects. And so I think it, it's the only thing missing in my mind it is, is, that, is that funding piece. Uh, we've got a plan, we've identified projects, we've identified initiatives, but we just need uh, the federal government's help in that. So I think that we just need to continue to make the chapel obligation a priority uh, for the coastal program. So any other questions for Wes? All right, thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Ms. Cooper. So, I don't know, I'm going to give us an update on the Louisiana Human Institute Climate Initiative Action Plan. Yes, Good morning, members. Um, it's great to be back with you all this morning. I am Lindsay Cooper, Policy Advisor in the Governor's Coastal Office and Project Manager for the Governor's Climate Initiative. And if the projector works right, I think you'll be able to see my slides on the screen. I last provided you all with an update on this project in the summer of 2021, where we were in the middle of developing um, this climate initiative, and now I'm happy to report to you all that we have a final climate action plan for Louisiana. But before I jump into the climate plan, uh, you might want to take that presentation with it. Yeah, that seems, that seems to be the there we go. So before um, before jumping into what the climate plan is and what it has in it, just wanted to bring us back to why the governor's coastal team is leading this work. So this graph is familiar to all of us showing um, coastal land loss over the next 50 years and flood risk that comes alongside of that. And land loss is brought about by a number of factors. One of those is sea level rise. And the, in this graphic, you can see that sea level rise hasn't been a big part of the coastal land loss picture in the past. As we look towards the end of the century, there will be an exponential growth in how coastal land loss, um, I'm sorry, how sea level rise is contributing to coastal land loss. And with that increase, you can see that increased sea level rise also leads to projected land loss, which as we all know, increases annual flood damages that we see. But alongside of that, um, and what we know about coastal land loss, there are also a lot of risks for not acting on climate action. Um, these five summary points are from the National Climate Assessment on risks of the Southeast due to climate change. And there are risks of increased heat, flooding, and vector-borne diseases on our infrastructure and our health risks. Um, flood frequency and extreme rainfall events and sea level rise also affect property values, um, as we all know along the coast, but also in other low-lying regions. Natural ecosystems are transformed, as it says in that third point. Um, 
because of changes in temperature extremes and the changes in what that looks like for our ecosystems and for our natural habitats as well. And again, extreme heat, um, I'm sorry, economic health and risk of rural communities also are a factor because of impacts to the, those more rural sectors such as agriculture, timber, manufacturing that reduce labor hours that can be worked due to increased heat and environmental stressors. And as we all know very well, there are disproportionate impacts for different communities and those that are most vulnerable. So understanding all of those impacts from climate change, the governor came to the secret board meeting in August of 2020, where he signed an executive order um, and established these emission reduction goals that are in line with what 25 other states have done and internationally through the Paris Agreement, um, what the US and 190 nations are committed to. And there's this eventual goal of reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Um, and he created a climate initiatives task force to develop a path of how Louisiana is going to meet this goal. And we eventually arrived at this nearly 200 page climate action plan. Um, for those that do not want to nor need to read the full 200 pages, we also have a four page executive summary of that work. But it took a a lot of effort to get to a place of a final climate action plan. Um, we have a 23 member climate initiative task force. Many of you are members from your agency service designees on that task force. We brought together a lot of diverging interests and backgrounds and needs to this work um, that made it challenging to reach a compromise on actions. And underneath that, we had 10 subgroups. We had six emission based sector committees to provide the expertise that we needed um, in our emission sectors, and then advisory groups as well. So all 11 groups together are about 150 stakeholders that were engaged in this work through public bodies alone. And we embarked on a 15 month collaborative process of 49 public meetings um, that brought us through a, a process that we tried to stay very uh, dedicated to to make sure we met the goal of the executive order of producing a climate plan by February 1st. One of the big first components of our work was defining what our objectives are in this effort. Our primary objective is reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but it's also important in how we do that. So our task force laid out other significant factors in our work, such as health and quality of life, uh, creating more equitable society, strengthening the workforce, conserving the environment, adapting to climate change, and managing for success. And another key component of our um, work was developing a GHG baseline. So we solicited an update to our greenhouse gas inventory. Um, in the middle of 2021, we had that data to use. And as you can see, Louisiana's emission profile is very different from the national um, <coughs> average. Most of our emissions are rooted in industry, which is not surprising to any of us. Um, and this was very helpful in determining and deciding what climate actions would we employ to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So after multiple public comment periods and iterations of our um, set of climate actions for the action plan, we finalized a final set of actions in January and as noted on the slide here, that includes eight different sections that reach across all of our emission sectors. Our inventory shows that although industry is a big component of our emissions, it will take everyone at the table to reduce emissions. And underneath those eight sections, we have 26 higher level approaches for reducing emissions, which are called strategies. And then strategies have actions underneath them. And there are 84 specific actions for Louisiana um, to meet that goal of net zero. And we had the opportunity to develop a pathway of how Louisiana could get to net zero by employing different emission reduction strategies. This is a very high level pathway for Louisiana to net zero. Um, it, it doesn't show all the different policies, but there were dozens in play so that we could determine which are the most helpful and successful for Louisiana's emissions. But as you can see from this graphic, there are three primary um, policies that will help Louisiana reduce our emissions and meet net zero. And in our climate action plan, we call those the big three. So those are renewable electricity generation tied with industrial electrification, 
and then fuel switching our industry to low and no carbon hydrogen. And as you can see, these three pillars are very focused on the industry, since that is our major emitting sector, and power as well. But I wanted to draw your attention to the section that we have on natural and working lands and wetlands. Um, this I see as the one most pertinent to the work that you all are doing. And under this section, we develop three different strategies. So those are the high level approaches. Strategy 14 is on natural lands, preserving them. Strategy 15 is on wetlands, restoring and conserving our wetlands. And then strategy 16 is on our working agriculture and forestry. To dive into strategy 15 for just a moment, there were three actions underneath this strategy. So as I mentioned, the strategies are higher level actions or more policy specific solutions. So these three actions covered a broad range of ways that we can continue to restore and conserve our wetlands and also maximize them for climate mitigation and adaptation goals that we have in Louisiana. So as I mentioned, immediate and aggressive implementation of our climate action plan is essential to be anywhere close to meeting our emission reduction goals, especially those in the near term. And in our climate action plan, with every action that we have, we have an implementation table that shows who the implementing partners are, what's near term action that needs to be taken, and what's our initial goal of what we're trying to reach through this action. And as you can see, Agencies do have a strong role in this plan, but it's not just agencies. We also task our universities, our communities, all members of our task force and subgroups to work together on how we're going to implement this climate action plan. And with that, I will turn it back over to the chairman and be glad to take any questions. All right, Ms. Cooper, thank you for the update. Any questions for <coughs> great point, Mr. Bourgeois, and I'm glad that you bring that up. I've been working with Neil and as well with the um, IIJA and Czar and the Governor's Office to cross-link how our climate action plan matches up with those of the IIJA. So directly, how can our climate plan get funded through this, but also how do we make proposals and applications stronger for the federal government through highlighting co-benefits with climate change, since that is one of the big priorities. Well, first of all, let me just publicly thank uh, Lindsay and Harry and Charles. They worked extremely difficult, uh, extremely difficult times, uh, and extremely hard. Uh, we've been doing this since February 2020, and uh, two weeks ago, I think it was unanimously approved by the by the task force, and all of my counterparts from all over the country are in awe that something like this can happen in the state of Louisiana. Um, we've got a challenge ahead of us, but I think we can we can meet it. One of the goals that I have is not to put us at a, an economic disadvantage because we're down on the island. So I'm trying to make sure that all of our folks to our east and west and all over the country are following suit. So I want to publicly thank you guys for all the work uh, that y'all put in. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Couldn't better myself, uh, Dr. Brown, just amount of work done by Lindsay and Charles and Mary on this and um, it was your team at, at DEQ was also a huge part of it as well. So thank you, uh, Dr. Brown, for your efforts. <coughs> Any other questions for Lindsay? Let me make a comment. Yes, ma'am. Um, Lindsay, thanks for the presentation. On your strategy number 14, uh, to preserve and expand natural lands and urban green spaces to maximize climate mitigation. <coughs> Just want to point out to 
you one of the problems that we're having in Calcasieu Parish for repetitive loss and severe repetitive loss properties <coughs> when we voluntarily acquire them uh, to remain green space forever. My question would be the problem we're having is in the situation we find ourselves in, there's nowhere else for them to move right now because all of our um, apartments have been damaged, um, houses are prime market right now in Capuchin Parish. So we're having that issue. But my question is, do you, or do you guys envision um, mapping out places in the future in this plan that might be amenable to urban open spaces? Because we're finding that we have a lot of flooding with re uh, repetitive loss issues in certain areas. I'm just wondering if this plan in the future might identify areas that, okay, we know this area floods a lot, so let's go see if everybody wants to voluntarily. You know, the homeowners are getting frustrated. We've had some people who've flooded five and six times in the last, you know, four, five, six, ten years. So um, my question is, will this plan be that expansive? Like, are you going to plan on identifying areas in coastal Louisiana that might be amenable to um, that certainly is our eventual goal. I believe it's at the Department of Agriculture, Soil and Water Conservation Districts tasked to work with municipal and local governments planners so that we can have that more granular approach than we might have in the governor's office. Um, but that certainly is the approach that we take in that action, is providing resources and helping to have those local assessments on urban forestry growth. <coughs> areas for expansion yeah. and, and just to follow up is um, since we're already doing the work and we're already acquiring these homes and we already have um, green space um, I don't even know how many we've done in the last year but I have two on the books right now to do in the next couple of weeks I'm um, just wondering if y'all can identify through GOSA those properties that we've already acquired that are green space right now and how that affects the flooding in the future I don't know if that's possible. That's just something to put in your head for later on because we're already doing the work. We're already acquiring these properties and having green space available throughout Papashi Parish. I'm just wondering in the future if that might be something that y'all can see how that affects the water flow um, once we've done a bunch of projects in an area. Just a good for thought. It was seen to me, and maybe Mr. Lander can talk on this, you know, DOT is undertaken an exercise in where they're modeling the entire state from, from the watershed standpoint. I don't know if we're watershed initiative. Um, it seems like there's been several projects in a particular region of the state that could affect water flow or flooding capabilities or flooding vulnerabilities. It seems like we all should be able to pick that up in the model, right, Pat? I don't know where we are in, in that effort. But yeah, we, we've uh, engaged with the, uh, the consultants uh, we've issued notice to proceed for all seven uh, modeling regions. They haven't really gotten into the modeling yet. They're preparing their modeling plans right now for approval. They, we do have some that are uh, in surveying right now. Uh, some of the regions, uh, not region four, which is the Calcasieu Cameron area, but we expect that fairly shortly. But uh, yeah, that, that should be able to be picked up with the modeling. Right. Any other questions or comments? We want to thank you, Ms. Cooper. Appreciate your good work. All right, Charles. Charles, can you give us a quick update on the Adaptive Governors Initiative? Another priority of the governors during the second term. Thank you, Chairman. Pull that mic a little closer to you. Yes. All right. Thank you again for being here. It's just going to be, uh, I'm going to talk about a large topic, uh, resilience, but uh, in a short amount of time, so uh, rest assured. Um, I just, to sum it up, then three, three big points that I just want to hit is just that adaptation is essential for every aspect of society and therefore has implications for every part of government. Um, we are making progress with this initiative now, so I want you to know that. And the third thing is that we have a deadline coming up in August, uh, particularly for state agencies, as we try to accomplish some of the Tasks identified in the executive order. Um, I'm not going to improve office right now. 
So we do this. Um, so so to, to show our, our elements of resilient coasts, um, you know, resilience is this concept that means different things to different people. And I think uh, sometimes if we take too narrow of a view, maybe we think we're just talking about levees, maybe uh, home elevations or a restoration program, or if you really think of it, you know, the working coast aspect comes in. But what we're trying to do through the, through the adaptive governance initiative is really broaden that, that understanding of what we're talking about. Um, so we want to say yes to all those things, but we want to add in additional elements. And so the first thing we, we talk about is a robust built environment. So yes, levees are important there, but so are how you build the roads and how facilities are constructed, and some of these engineering and design um, type, type concepts that, that really do apply to um, not just buildings and roads, but every, every service delivery agency has got, it's got a building that they depend on to kind of do their thing. So, so that's really important um, there. So, so that's how we, we can bring in the division administration, DOTD, housing programs, Department of Corrections, everybody's, those types of agencies are being affected by, by, by that element. Um, the second resilience element is related to a sustainable natural environment, right? So that, that is the restoration program in CPRA, but it's also, you know, everything Dr. Brown's given the DEQ for air and water, it's, it's, it's these fisheries habitats, WMAs and wildlife and fisheries, um, coastal zone management and DNR, all these things are, are happening kind of under this quadrant. Um, and then the third element is, is vibrant economic activity, right? And so that's where the jobs and economic engines um, that, that LWC and LED are, are focused on on a daily basis. But it also pulls in other issues that I know that this board talks about, like flood insurance, how that changes, you know, department of insurance, all the different types of insurance that are being affected and have an impact on kind of the long range sustainability of communities. Uh, we want to be able to capture that under our concept of resilience. And then finally, um, we have a whole element for community or social resilience that we call health and opportunity for all coastal residents. And that's where this resilience framework really stretches out to agencies that aren't represented on this board, but are so important to, to how communities uh, just look and exist into the future. And so that's where we get Department of Health, Department of Veterans Affairs, Children and Family Services. They all have a role to play in this, in this bigger vision of resilience. Um, and so these are our four elements. And no matter if you're talking about one element at a time, or hopefully you're thinking across elements and, and multiple things at once, um, adaptation is kind of the, the tool that, that we need to kind of focus in on um, to, to make progress in the direction we're going to go in. Um, so the question is, how do, we, how do we adapt under all these different aspects of government and across, across the board? Um, how do we promote that all the time? So the August uh, 2020 executive order the governor signed on coastal resilience really gives us a structure to do that and a process to go through. And so, Louisiana, as you know, is, is one of maybe just 10 states to, to have a chief resilience officer kind of uh, at the point for this. Uh, but, but even more important, that we've got resilience coordinators at every single agency um, who are kind of really our point people to kind of work through this with us. On the process side, we've identified, the executive board identifies kind of three basic activities for every agency to be engaged in. Um, step one is to identify our vulnerabilities. So what are our vulnerabilities to our assets and our programs? What are the risks we face today and in the future? What are the risks that are recurring, like land loss, sea level rise? What are the things that are acute, like a big flood or a hurricane? Uh, we also need to be thinking, you know, is this a risk just to me and my agency, or is this something that's gonna affect, cascade across government and really cause problems everywhere? So this is the kind of um, step one of the process that, that helps identify priorities and really lays the groundwork for the adaptation, which is, which is step two. So, that's really the most important thing. How do we, how do we respond to these, these, these inherent risks that we're facing? Is it gonna be simple or hard? Is it gonna be something that we, we can do today? Or is this gonna be a 10 year effort that we need to kind of get going? Um, and then the other big question is, you know, what, who are our partners that we're gonna to need to pull into this? Where's the money gonna come from? And how are we gonna do that? So that's all part of this adaptation phase that, that we have on here. And then the third step is just how do we institutionalize this? How do we, how do we bake this in? How do we continue to talk about this um, uh, you know, across administrations? How do we monitor our progress and how do we keep doing that? So those are kind of our big three steps um, that, that we're working through. Um, and again, the resilience coordinators are, are really who's making all this happen. So I just want to thank them. I've got their names up on the board here um, for all the work they've done. They've, they've been on webinars with us. I've been going through some of these, using these tools that we've developed. Um, and they're really our entry point for the decision making that goes on at all these different agencies. So our, our premise has been all along that, that you know, uh, 
Uh, I'm not an expert on everybody's agency. You are the experts on your agency, but we can hopefully bring in an understanding of, of what environmental change is, is coming and some adaptation best practices that kind of help help kind of um, you know help you through these these kinds of processes. Um, so so even though this is meant to be a long term transformative process, we do have some successes already. So I just want to kind of highlight a couple of those. Um, one, you know, LDH with everything they've had going on with the pandemic. They've uh, put a tremendous amount of effort in this vulnerability assessment, and they really, really presented us a comprehensive understanding of all the different ways that these environmental changes are also going to pose a risk to their agency. So they've, they've done a tremendous job. I want to thank uh, Mark Moses at the division, who's really helped, you know, already started kind of thinking through um, how do we make sure that state dollars that are going to be invested in facilities that are actually going to be able to um, perform their entire intended lifespan. So we don't want to build a bunch of stuff and invest a bunch of dollars and have to rebuild it all. So we're kind of thinking through that process with, with Mark and the vision. And then DCFS, after Hurricane Ida, you know, they looked at, at the, the, the devastation and the impacts on communities, and they said, you know, some people might want to move after this. So they applied for a social services block grant to um, be able to provide services. So if you have employment services or healthcare services or other things, you know, at your current home and you're moving, how can you make sure that your, those services move with you and you can actually support um, you know, these vulnerable people in this, in this moment of need. And so I just think those, those are just three good examples of agencies really kind of doing exactly what they're, they're there to do, but they're doing it in this context, this larger context of, of coastal change and climate change uh, for that one. Um, we are, we have had six agencies so far complete vulnerability assessments, um, and we're already gathering a lot of insights into kind of what it's going to look like across government um, from just those few um, so far. A couple examples just to kind of, again, kind of get our minds around what we're talking about in terms of resilience. Um, this Office of Aging and Adult Services, you know, in, in the Department of Health, they um, coordinate and provide um, all the needed preventative, primary health care, um, long-term services for, for elderly folks so that they can stay in their communities. So this is a super essential service, but when Facility floods, you know, it's not just the loss of the building and equipment and records, which is a problem, but you're not able to keep those people in their communities. If they, that now, where, where are you going to go for all those services? So that's a huge, a huge, you know, vulnerability that we're seeing you know, across the coast. Um, and another example of the Department of Corrections, you know, when a storm is approaching, um, inmates have to be moved out of high-risk locations, other places around the state. So that's a tremendous amount of manpower for the, for the department. It's, it's a lot of inmates on the roads, which puts them at risk. Um, just from a safety point of view, um, but also when you when you have, even if the facility isn't ultimately damaged, you've got people somewhere else for some amount of time, and so you're not able to do education programs and reentry programs and um, have those employment programs that, that that are that are so good at the kind of rehabilitation side. They're all thrown off by by this by this relocation. So when we're looking across these vulnerabilities, some some big picture things are kind of jumping out of this. Um, a facilities are at risk across. All agencies, like some in some way, shape, or form, and so that's going to be something that we'll probably have different ways to kind of think through what that looks like for different agencies. But that very quickly becomes a program and service delivery problem uh, for people. So it, it can be no access to services, but it also means that your clients might be relocated, but even if it's just temporary, um, or or it might be permanent. How are we going to keep track of these people that we're that we're, that we're serving um, as a state? So that's the big deal. And then the third. Um, it's just that, you know, your your workers, your your, your employees aren't immune from all these different risks that we're facing. So there, you know, if your house is flooded, how are you gonna you know, make it in and provide this such a service? Um, that's really a challenge. And then again, on the after the storm or after the disaster, how do we continue to attract good people to, to come to our communities and to do this work and, and keep the communities vibrant? Um, it, it's it's hard sometimes to kind of keep keep good people coming in. If, if, the, if the, the main narrative that's out there is just that we flood all the time or, or, or what have you. Um, and so we're looking across those different vulnerabilities for, for what are some of the adaptation options that we can move to. And so, um, you know, kind of just wrapping up, kind of getting back to what I said before, there's a deadline coming up. We're trying to get all the agencies to kind of go through these three steps um, by August. And so we've kind of given them a soft deadline of July so that we can make sure that we communicate up to the department secretaries. About what, what we're finding before before we come back to this board um, in the fall, 
Um, and so we are we have a tool for this too. So we're we're not telling agencies that they have to um, adapt to every problem that the future is going to throw at them. We don't have to have a solution in place for all these things, but we do want to have this this kind of um, uh, documentation. We don't want to start the process and figure out okay, what are our vulnerabilities? What are what are the priorities that we have to take action on? How are we going to start doing that? Um, so, so there's this little form that, that's only really got four questions on it, and that's what we're kind of asking people to have done by August. So it has you summarize your vulnerabilities, um, describe your adaptation responses and pathways, and then finally create a short narrative for kind of what this means for the state as a whole. Um, and we're going we're gonna to share those out with the board, you know, like I said, in the fall. Um, and I think, too, just, just when you think about kind of getting all of these in from all these different agencies, you can just kind of start to see a, a statewide resilience plan coming into the view, and I think that's something that can help us, you know, for all these IIJ discussions we're talking about. Like, what, what do we want? Where are we going? What are our needs? Um, I think this is a big part of that, in the, again, in this broader broader context of resilience that means a lot of different things. Um, so, and, you know, that's just one of the big lessons from the master plan. You know, again, funding is going to be, you know, an issue for all these things, but if you don't know what you need, you don't know how to ask for it, you don't know how to find partners to do that. Um, and so just last a uh, couple things. Uh, we, we've also created a manual um, and a website, uh, putting this on the CPRI website. Uh, we've had a couple agencies that they've changed resilience coordinators, or sometimes when you're kind of going through these steps, you need to kind of spread the effort out across the department. And so we have all the context you need, all the forms you need kind of in one place in this manual that's emailed out to everybody um, as part of this. Um, and then, so just again, our, our next steps and our, our timeline here is so we, I'm going to be engaging, uh, reaching out to everybody, one-on-one uh, -on -one engagement with resilience coordinators in all departments to try to help support them as they kind of go through these three steps. We want to continue to engage um, in small groups and larger groups around just the, the overall resilience discussion and adaptation discussion that's going on um, that relates to infrastructure, climate plan, as we just talked about, um, all these different things. And then finally, um, we have a series of cross-agency and long-term recommendations to build resilience. So we've been talking to all these different agencies about the issues that they're coming up with. We've also been thinking, so what's, what's a cross recommend? What else do we need to be doing? And so behind the kind of the last slide on this presentation, we'll see 10 recommendations that we've kind of come up with based on these conversations that we are going to be trying to move forward. And I think it's going to be, we're having conversations um, already to kind of prioritize these, figure out who's the right lead for them, but it's going to be important that we kind of work at, at both the scales, both the agency scale and the cross section scale in the coming years. So that's what we have planned, um, and with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, Charles, I like the way that you, you opened that presentation by saying that Resilience means different things to, to different people, and it certainly means different things to different state agencies. And, and, and your job is really to ensure that we are resilient as a state. So in CPRA's mind, being resilient may be having a fortified beach headland with a levee and an elevated home or a business. But being resilient in LDH's mind is if that levy were to fail or didn't perform as designed and you've got, I think we use an example of a Cameron Parish Medical Center that's flooded multiple times, then what does that mean for that facility? And so the LDH needs to be looking at environmental information that's in the master plan and then coming up with plans that if X happens, then Y is going to happen, right? And so if Cameron Parish Medical Center is, is flooded, where are Cameron Parish residents going to go for Healthcare needs. Uh, do they have partnerships in Lapuja Terrible Parish where they can send their residents to? So it's, it's, I think too many people look at resilience as, yeah, let's just flood proof businesses, let's raise homes and make sure we've got a fortified levy system and coastal restoration projects. But it's, it's much broader than that when you're talking about being resilient as a state. DCFS, LDH, all, all of these guys have got to start looking. Uh, at these, some of these significant environmental scenarios that are that are playing out year after year after year. Um, I don't know if you want to add any more. I think if you gave it when we met 
going through this presentation, you had a great example, a believable example, of Cameron Harris of a, of a healthcare facility that repeatedly flooded um, and that LDH identified as this is through the vulnerability assessment that this is an area that we need to really get our head around and come up with a strategic plan moving forward. I mean, I just, just agree. I mean, yes, and it, but it makes it more complicated, but to, to kind of coordinate and think about these complex issues like over time and over different types of risk, but it's so important to, um, to just what our actual ability to kind of continue to have a kind of coastal community is going to mean. We saw that during Hurricane Ida, right, where we keep talking about how well the levees and the restoration projects did, but if you don't have a power system or if you don't have a water system like happened in, in the southwest after, after um, the Laura, you can't do anything with no water. So we've got to really, we can't just limit ourselves when we think about what it, what it takes to be resilient. So that's why I just, again, just thank all the agencies that have had great staff working on this with us. Um, and even the agencies, too, I mentioned that, that aren't, you know, under the governor's directive, under the executive order, um, you know, cultural recreation, tourism, insurance, um, are all, you know, partnering with us on this. And so we are having this conversation across the country, which is where we need to be. Um, so that's good news, um, but it's going to be a long, a long, you know, this adaptation process is going to be ongoing you know, over, over the decades. So. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'd just like to point out, by looking at this picture, this is the Capuchin Marine Tower in Lake Charles, Louisiana. It is the only building that was not wind retrofitted after Hurricane Rita. It is the only building that had almost every single wind have blown out. So our mayor, Nick Hunter, got up right after the storm, about two days, and said, mitigation works. And so kudos to GOSAB and KC. I worked, and I know about this, because I was the, the hazard mitigation specialist um, that did all the wind retrofitting of every building, every hospital, every fire station, every police station, and every downtown uh, municipal building. So I know this, but one of the things I would say to you, Charles, is this is not pretty when it's getting done, like the wind retrofit, but in the future, HOMA has a prime opportunity to understand that what we did after Rita to protect our buildings worked. And so every building does not look like this, thank God, and we had um, the hospitals and the firemen and the police stations all done, thank goodness. But what I would say to you guys is part of your resilience is making that a pretty picture. Making it as big of a deal to go win retrofit a building as Rabbit Island down in Cameron, where we're saving birds. Um, I think that is the message that I would like to see. And thank you for this, because we've needed this for a long time. But I am grateful that I'm the person that helped GOSA um, put in all that resilience work into Lake Charles. Otherwise, I can't even imagine where we would have been. So um, going forward, I'm grateful to see this. So thank you. Thank you, Lori. Ms. Cormier, any other questions for Charles? All right. Thank you, Mr. Sutcliffe. Mr. Wolf-Price up here is going to give us an update. Um, actually, I hope we're making some announcements on the Conservation and Restoration Partnership Awards. Appreciate it. Uh, greetings, everybody. Yeah, I, Mr. Chairman, I do have some announcements for some uh, uh, Partnership Fund Awards. I'm going to do it now. Okay, so I do have some announcements for some Partnership Fund Awards. Uh, this is a companion piece to the presentation I gave in uh, October when we announced that the uh, RFP was going out. So, um, just real quick, as a reminder, we dedicated a million dollars worth of certain funding to match on proposals for conservation and restoration projects that um, our partners across the state would be interested in funding themselves. Uh, we do this as a, a, a program, as a mechanism to leverage our funding to achieve our common restoration goals. That means the partners get to get their restoration and conservation goals uh, completed, and we get to be a part of that. So uh, through the process, we selected six uh, projects to get awards this year. And what that means in uh, the, the bigger picture is we've got 37 projects that we've funded since uh, 2008 in this program, about 11.6 million. 
has uh, come from our uh, state dollars, and about 15.5 million has come from our partners, and that's you know totally more than 27 million in restoration. These are those six projects. This is just a table breakdown of, uh, of what what we have uh, decided to fund this year. We've got the project name. You have our partners in the second column, and then the uh, amount of funding that is being allocated by the state in the third column, and the matching amount in the fourth column. Can you run through those? Can you? I'm having a hard time seeing where I'm sitting, so yeah. I'm yeah. guessing Kareem at there again. Can't see. Yeah. Let's see. We're going to bump that up a little bit. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Just run through the mountain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the Mud Lake Area Terrace is a phase three uh, project. This is actually the third increment we funded in this program over the years. Uh, that's done by Apache Louisiana Minerals. Uh, both partners, uh, the state and Apache, are putting uh, $100,000 each to build that. Then we have the Deuce Point Marsh Restoration Project. Uh, that's by CRCL. We are putting $60,000 towards that project, and they are bringing 85, a little more than 85,000 uh, to the project. That's um, primarily a vegetative planting uh, project. The Fort Fouchon Terracing Project is being done by Ducks Unlimited. Uh, we are contributing 300,000, uh, 300, and they are bringing uh, in excess of 2.3 million in match to that project. Uh, the Couchy Lake and Sabine National Wildlife Refuge Shoreline Protection and Oyster Reef Restoration is an as another phase three project. It's the third increment that we funded in this program. Uh, it's being done by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, those, uh, the Nature Conservancy and ourselves are both by 300,000. That project. The Ridge Habitat Restoration in St. Bernard Parish is being done by Posh Train Conservancy. We are uh, contributing in excess of $40,000 and they're contributing $42,000. And again, that's primarily a vegetative planting project. And then we have the Woodlands Preserve Restoration uh, by the Woodlands Conservancy. We're contributing nearly $200,000 and they're bringing uh, in excess of $500,000 in match. And that is to uh, uh, conserve their, their coastal forest. Uh, habitats they have, about 800 uh, acres of uh, coastal forest habitat. Um, let, me, uh, let me zoom back out now for this slide. And so that, that was the high level. You know, those are the projects we're funding, but this is, this is what we're getting out of those projects. We've got nearly four miles of terracing being completed, uh, but that doesn't include the miles and miles we've completed in other increments of terracing in this program, as well as several additional miles of, uh, of terracing that, that will be put on the ground with the same mobilizations that are going to be used in this, in this uh, program. And uh, all told, we're going to have somewhere between 90 to 90 100,000 linear feet, you know, close to 20 miles of uh, terraces um, uh, working together to uh, support our nearby marshes and lakes. Uh, along the similar lines, we've got the Living Shoreline Oyster Reef in West Coast. Uh, it's a half mile stretch that we're funding this time, but this will be 2.5 miles total that we funded uh, over the years, and there's potential for more uh, that uh, the Nature Conservancy is uh, coming together. So we're, we're getting pretty close to a, a fairly comprehensive uh, living shoreline oyster reef in West Cove on the uh, northern and western uh, shore face uh, of, uh, of West Cove. Uh, we've got over 10,000. Ten thousand plants being put on the ground this is being done uh, through volunteer efforts as well as uh, uh, NGO, NGO staff. And then uh, we, uh, I mentioned eight hundred acres of coastal forest that we're uh, getting involved with this time with the Wilderness Conservancy. Um, the last two awards we've been able to actually dip our toes into the conservation side of things, uh, as our namesake for this program suggests we should. And uh, also, uh, especially this is the first time we'll be getting into uh, supporting conservation of coastal forests. So uh, an even bigger picture view of this is, you know, this program, although it is one of our smaller programs, is pretty broad reach. Um, just in this year alone, these projects are going to touch five parishes. We've got uh, two in Cameron, one in St. Tammany, Lafouche, St. Bernard, and uh, Orleans Parish. And then ran through all the, the restoration features, we've got pretty diverse set of uh, restoration features and that's serving uh, a variety of habitat sites. And then uh, a particular note this year is that we have a lot of match coming from our partners to do this restoration and conservation. Um, you know, we're putting a million 
uh, towards these projects, but they're bringing well over three million in uh, in match. So that's good um, return on investment for us, and I'm, you know, uh, hopefully our partners agree. But we're we're getting a, a lot of bang for a buck there. And then you know this program wouldn't be anything without our partner agencies. Uh, we've got six different uh, partners, five NGOs, and one private entity that are uh, putting dollars into island ground restoration. So. Uh, kudos to them, absolutely. They're the ones that uh, implement these projects. I just get to tell you all about it. So, all right, looking ahead. Uh, we have a, a request for another round of awards in the FY23 annual plan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Haas, everybody else have talked a lot about surplus funding, but that's where that would come from. So, uh, you know, uh, supporting Supporting that uh, that surplus request would uh, bring another round of awards in uh, uh, in FY23. So I just want to throw that out there. We bring another round, Kent, but it would also double the allocation, right? Mm -hmm. So we had a million this year, and I believe we've got two million in surplus friends. So you would significantly ramp up the, the partnership opportunity. Here. Yeah. yeah, indeed. I I didn't want to uh, you know. I didn't want to oversell it, just, you know, we never know what's going to happen, but yeah, we're, we're, hoping, we're hoping to have a lot more money next year. We hope that uh, our projects can uh, either expand in you know, magnitude or volume of both. So, uh, but yeah, if you want any updates on the program in general, the projects, uh, how how this line item and annual plans look for, give me a call, email me, uh, and then, uh, you know, if you just have questions in general, uh, you know, this is how you contact me. So, I'll open it up for questions if anyone's got any. Thank you very much. Great program, great partnership opportunity. He's across the coast on this, and uh, appreciate your good work. Any questions for Ken before we let him go? All right. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate it. Uh, any public comments from members of the audience? Okay. We have a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. McGinnis, a second by Mr. Burke. We are adjourned. Thanks everybody for being here.